Welcome to Lofty Pursuits. This is the first of a series of videos for Kickstarter for our Cane to Candy video. This is sort of a little sidebar that didn't fit in the main video, so I thought I'd release it first, about baking biscuits, because biscuits was such an important part of the food and diet of the early Americans, specifically around here. And we're lucky enough to have a working farm from the 1880s in a local museum called the Tallahassee Museum. This is the same location and same museum where the sugar cane that we're going to make into the cane syrup was grown and the cane syrup itself was made. I'm Judy Strickland and I'm a, a uh, educator and, and uh, I do um, mm -hmm. living history here at the museum. This is, this is, uh, this is a, a real kitchen from 1880 and we do things the way they did back in 1880. And uh, I'm using a wood-burning stove. It takes about an hour to get the stove hot enough to cook. And what we burn is uh, split oak, and we use uh, uh, some uh, fat lighter to get the fire going. And right now I'm making biscuits in the from scratch. And the recipe is flour, baking powder, salt, and uh, I use lard as shortening. And I've been making biscuits. Oh, let's see. I learned to make biscuits when I was 17. I married a I married a, a, a southerner. I'm not I'm I'm from the Midwest. I married a southerner and I found out real fast he expected hot biscuits for breakfast every morning. So I learned to make biscuits. And uh, so you know, I can pretty much uh, approximate the the, uh, the measurements for this because I know about how many it takes. This is this is a pastry blender, and this would be your pioneer uh, food processor. And the secret to making biscuits is that you cut in the shortening. You want to cut it up into very small pieces, and each piece gets coated with the flour. That's what makes your biscuits flaky. And I'm using lard as a shortening because that makes the flakiest biscuits See, this is breaking up the, the shortening into very little pieces. You want them, for biscuits, you want them about the size of a pea. And I'm using buttermilk for making the butter as the liquid and plus just some regular milk. And again, this is one of these things that measurements are approximate. You know, you put milk in till it till it, till it looks right. Thousands. <laughs> when I was married to my first husband, I made I made biscuits every every morning for breakfast. He expected hot biscuits for breakfast. Till one day he said, "That's the first decent biscuit you've ever made." And I never made him another biscuit. That's why he was my first husband. <laughs> But last last year, for a syrup day out here, uh, it was a pretty day, unlike today, and we had a big crowd. And I made about nine dozen biscuits just oh just in one day. Biscuits biscuits are actually quite simple to make. I mean, the the recipe is quite simple. The, the The secret to having good biscuits is in the handling. You don't want to handle them too much. It's not like making a yeast bread where you're going to uh, knead the dough a lot to to improve the texture. The, the texture of, of biscuits is actually improved by a minimum of, of kneading. You want just enough to make a firm dough so that the all the flour kind of clears the side of the bowl. That ought to do it. Now, The other thing is a pastry cloth. And a lot of flour, so it doesn't stick. <laughs> a 
see I'm all I'm going to do is just is just fold it together a couple of times to make sure that the, the dough sticks together. And if I was being formal, I would I would roll this out with a rolling pin, but I'm not, so I just pat it out to the thickness that I want. And I like a tall fluffy biscuit. Three quarters of an inch thick, and it will double. Uh, as it rises because it's got baking powder in it. And you notice this, in the true in the true spirit of a farmhouse, our uh, biscuit cutter is recycled. Some people use a cup or, or glass. But I like the, I like, this is a, I think, tomato paste from a batch of chili. And uh, it makes a nice size biscuit for sharing with visitors. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I would be, I would be so embarrassed if it fell off on the floor and ruined a whole pan of biscuits. So you need to catch it. Yes, I have to be really fast and catch it. Uh, your sweetener, your, your 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 usual sweetener for anything was cane syrup because you could grow it, uh, that grow the cane yourself and make it. Um, granulate making granulated sugar like we buy at the store was a more of a factory process and took a, a, a lot more skill and a lot more fuel. But uh, most farms in this area grew their own cane and made syrup. And uh, that's what she used for sweetener. And biscuits were your daily biscuits and cornbread were your daily bread. Sliced bread in a plastic bag like we're used to uh, had not come along yet. And uh, people ate a lot of cornbread because you grew the corn. Now, uh, wheat for biscuits does not grow. You can grow it here, but it. It doesn't grow nearly as well as corn does. Most people would, if they could afford it, would go, to, would buy a barrel of flour once a year for baking, and and you would have biscuits for breakfast, and you would have cornbread for dinner, and uh, supper was whatever, which whatever was left. And what children carried for their to school for their lunch was usually a biscuit. And the, the, the proper way to eat biscuits and syrup is you poke a hole in the side of the biscuit with your finger, pour in some syrup, and that way it's all enclosed. And you, you take, wrap it in a, a bandana or put it in an old syrup bucket, and that's what you carry to school for your lunch. Now this goes in the oven. And let me put another stick of firewood on the stove because you want a high heat for. Because you want a nice high temp uh, temperature for your biscuits so they bake fast and and uh, rise quickly. Uh, with a with a wood stove. Uh, you can't gauge the temperature as exactly as you do with a modern stove, but it'll take approximately the same time uh, that as, it, as it would in a modern stove. It'll be 10 to 15 minutes. <laughs> so, so how am I going to know when, when the stove is hot enough to cook since I don't have a temperature gauge? Well, I learned this trial and error, and then I read it and confirmed it with a, a uh, antique cookbook that had a whole bunch of different ways for gauging your oven temperature, some of which were fairly horrifying. Like, open the oven door, put your arm in the oven, and count how many seconds until you smell burning hair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this one was a lot simpler and easier and not nearly as hard on me. When, when 
I build the fire, I fill the kettle with warm, with, with cold water, I put it usually on this burner, which is the hottest burner, and when, can you hear the kettle singing? Can you hear the hum kind of from it steaming? When the kettle starts to sing, it's hot enough for cookies, which is about 350. When it comes to a full boil, uh, it's hot enough for biscuits, which is about 450. Now today I don't have a good representation because I've got it's not on the hottest burner because I've got my gumbo on the hot burner. Uh, but you can hear the, 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 the kettle is, is steaming, so it's, it's, it's hot enough to bake. Now, I need to make another pan, or need another um, jar of butter. The way you cook on a wood stove, is there's no controls for turning the heat up and down. So you can control it to a certain extent by how much wood you put in the, in the, in the stove, but mostly you to cook on top of the stove you move your pans back and forth to get the right heat and this is your high heat directly over the fire medium and then away from the fire is is your low heat you've heard the saying put things on the back burner this is the crock pot setting over here on the back burner well, the, the recipe for butter is heavy cream and agitation. And you can agitate it all different ways. This is the simplest, which is just shaking it in a jar. Uh, I've got over here, I've got a little crank churn that we use for school programs. Uh, over here we have a larger uh, stand-up churn that you would use if you had a large quantity of, of cream, say a, a gallon or so. Um, and you shake it or crank it or go up and down with it uh, and and eventually it's going to fluff up into whipped cream and then the whipped cream gets thicker and thicker and thicker and then all of a sudden it separates into liquid and lumps the liquid is buttermilk and i'm pouring this off to use in the next batch of biscuits and the lumps are your butter. And I'm working it with a spoon to get the buttermilk out. And then I'll put a pinch of salt in it and that is all there is to making butter. Now how long it takes to make butter depends on a number of factors like uh, how old the cream is, uh, your biorhythms, the, uh, the phases of the moon, the precession of the equinoxes, but mostly it depends on the temperature. On a cold day today, it will take sometimes an hour to make, get butter to, to, to uh, make. Um, on a hot day in the middle of the summer, 10 minutes. So I cheat. I have a little metal pan here with a little bit of water in it and I've got it over here on the low heat side of the stove and I set my jar of cream in it until the cream warms up a little bit which makes it a lot faster but it's still taking a while because the the air temperature is, is quite cold Now the color of your butter depends on what the cows are eating. If they're eating a lot of green food, you'll get a lot more uh, yellow color to it. This time of year, most cows are eating hay or si and or silage. And uh, so your butter is usually pretty pale in the summertime. You'll get, get nice yellow butter. I grew up on a dairy farm with, with Jersey, so I've been making making butter since I was literally knee high and to this day when the butter makes when it when it separates into lumps and liquid it's like yes you know it's this it's this little little miracle that it's because I'm a little 
want them browned a little bit. Let's see, I'm still getting 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 some buttermilk out of there. It's very satisfying and 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 actually quite easy to do. And usually just a sprinkle of salt. Usually you'll get uh, in a, with with uh, heavy whipping cream, you'll get about half butter and half buttermilk. So on a quart of cream like this, you'll get about a pint of, of uh, butter and about a pint of buttermilk. And of course, buttermilk is useful for making biscuits, so you can use it for pancakes or cornbread, all kinds of all kinds of baking. Alright, we're going to call these done, and who would like a biscuit? <laughs> let's, let's split some biscuits here and butter them, and notice how nice and fluffy these are. I like my biscuits tall like this. Turn this around and stick it back in the oven. Brown the ones on the other end. As you can imagine, since the fire's over here, the the uh, oven does not bake real even, and so you have to remember to turn things if you want things to brown evenly. The lanterns. Lanterns. All right, who would like a biscuit? Yes, if you would. And there's there's napkins here. Uh, on Saturdays, uh, I'm almost always here cooking something. Please come and visit us, and do come by the, ki the farmhouse kitchen, because on Saturdays, I bake and I share. Cool. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to us here on YouTube and remember to turn on notifications. A special thanks to our Kickstarter backers for backing the production of this video and to the Tallahassee Museum that let us shoot it there. If you'd like to check out the candy we make, please go to www.pd.net and you can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you again for watching.